Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Oh, good. Wonderful. I, it, is, it is a good Sunday morning. Today, the Vikings kick off their 2019 Super Bowl run. <laughs> Who's, yes, we're excited. We are excited. Oh, man, football is back. I can't wait. Um, can't wait to get home. The game's at noon, so we are keeping this short and sweet this morning. <laughs> God loves you, love other people, see you next week. Um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm keeping you till one today. I hope you set, set the game to record. Um, so it's a good day. Vikings football is back. We're going to beat Atlanta. And it's an even better day because it is Amanda and I's sixth anniversary today. Six years ago, we got married. She's wonderful. Everybody, go say congratulations to her. Tell her something that you love about her. Give her money. I don't know. What do you do? Um, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Mo. I am the youth pastor here at North Haven Church. And like Pastor Don mentioned, if you're joining us for the first time today, welcome. We are so glad that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning worshiping here with us at North Haven. Pastor Adam asked me to take the message this week. He's up at camp with his daughter, so I have the honor of wrapping up the Chosen series today. And I don't think I've graduated to his uh, table preaching yet, so we're going going with the music stand today. Um, And no, I know what all of you are thinking. I am not going to be singing for you this morning. (laughs) We actually want people to stay at church. (laughs) Um, can you imagine Pastor Adam gets back next week and there's like four people here and three of them are my family and where, wait, where did everyone go? Well, well Alex sang, so uh, no, nobody wants me to sing, I'm taking that off the table right off the bat. Um, anyways, back when I finished my freshman year, uh, freshman year of college at Northwestern, uh, the one here, not in Chicago, uh, I'll tell you, that conversation gets old in a hurry when you're a senior. Uh, where are you going to school next year? Northwestern. Oh, wow. Immediately, people are impressed. Northwestern is such a great school. At that point, I realize what they're thinking. And then I have to explain to them that it's actually Northwestern they've probably never heard of, and it's here in the cities. And I, I got very used to the face people make when they assume that you graduated near the top of your class quickly followed by the awkward realization that they were wrong about that. Um, well, that was fun. Anyways, uh, I, I went to Northwestern here in the cities, and I studied youth and family ministry. And I knew this was what I wanted to do going in, and, and, and I, I could tell that my dad was a little skeptical. He spent uh, nearly 30 years in the business field working for IBM, and I, I don't think he understood the call of ministry. But that was the choice I made. And when my freshman year came to an end, being the procrastinator that I am, I was sitting in my dorm room, dorm room during finals week with no plan for the summer. My friends had jobs at camp or, or internships lined up, and, and I was packed up and I had no idea what I was going to do. Out of the blue, one night, my, my friend texted me asking if I've ever heard of YouthWorks. And YouthWorks is, is a student missions organization that Facilitate, facilitates uh, middle school and, and high school mission trips um, uh, around the, the country in, in about 70 different locations. Many, many of our students here at North Haven have gone on YouthWorks trips, uh, but I, at that point, had never heard of them before. Um, and, but late that night, I was scrolling through their website, uh, learning everything I could about YouthWorks. My friend texted me about YouthWorks because uh, they were still hiring for the summer. I didn't think this could be right. Summer started in like a day and a half. Uh, But there it was on their homepage. Still hiring for summer 2010. So there I was, 1 a.m. the night before a final, filling out an application for a position for the summer, which is probably why the Northwestern and Chicago route never worked out for me. Uh, Early that next morning, I got a call from someone at YouthWorks asking if I was available for a phone interview that afternoon. I was. I spoke with YouthWorks about a position as program coordinator for a site. 
I would be in charge of the activities on site in the evening, uh, as well as preparing a worship service uh, each evening, including a message. And after the interview, I went on to my last final of the year. I got a call back offering me me the position. Uh, The only catch, they would need an answer before their office closed that evening. Uh, I'd have to report to to a training in in one of four potential cities, uh, either here in Minneapolis, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Denver, Colorado, or uh, or Philadelphia. Um, That was, you know, I'd have to go there in in a week. Um, This was all happening very quick. Uh, I went from nothing to do for the summer to the option of living in some unknown location doing ministry all summer, and they needed a commitment in a couple hours. Well, I was instantly nervous. I had never done anything like that before. Uh, I, was, I chose to go to college 20 minutes from my house. Um, this was a huge commitment that I had to figure out in, in a very short amount of time. So I called my dad. Uh, remember, he was a little skeptical about my career choice at this point. Um, and I, I think I, I called him hoping he would talk me out of it, to be honest. Have you ever done that, where you've asked someone's advice assuming that they, that they would say one thing just so you had an excuse not to step into something you were unsure of? Well, I explained to him uh, what, what YouthWorks was, and it would mean I would be gone all summer, and that I had to decide in an hour, essentially. Uh, needless to say, he surprised me, and I'll never forget it. He, he said to me, if you're serious about this career, this is something I think you need to do. By the end of the summer, you'll know if youth ministry is something you want to do for the long term or if it's not right for you. Now, my dad also knew I didn't have any plans for the summer, so this could have been him just trying to get me to do something. Uh, I don't, uh, but I, I don't think it was. I think God used my dad, who was skeptical about his son doing youth ministry, to encourage me to take a step of faith despite how nervous and fearful I was. I took the job. Thankfully, the training was here in Minneapolis, and I went on to serve that summer in in Cincinnati. I absolutely loved it. I went on to serve two more summers with YouthWorks, and I had some of the best experiences of my life. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been discussing how different people throughout Scripture have responded to God's call for their lives. We've looked at King Saul and Moses, Sarah, Lot's wife, Last week, we we talked about Peter and how even though he was imperfect, Jesus used him in in mighty ways. Today, we're finishing up this series by looking at Joshua. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, you can can turn to Joshua chapter 1. We'll be focusing on verses 1 through 9 of the first chapter. And if you don't have one with you, there's uh, a Bible in the pew in front of you, or you can follow along on the screen or uh, in the Bible app. Just search North Haven Church. But before we get into the scripture this morning, I want us to catch up on what's happening by the time we get to Joshua. Moses was called by by God to lead Israel out of slavery in Egypt. God worked miracles to free his people and and miraculously sustained them in the desert during 40 years of wandering. He split the Red Sea so his people could cross safely. He provided direction through pillars of cloud and fire, and he, he sent manna and quail to eat and gave them water to drink. He spoke to Moses on, on Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments. See, God showed up for his people time and time again as Moses led them. And the hope of the promised land was always before them. But Moses was not the person to lead Israel across the Jordan River and into the promised land. That's where Joshua comes in. Before Moses dies, he he calls Joshua in Deuteronomy 31 to his side and tells him that you are to lead this people into the promised land. And that's where we pick up with Joshua today. So let's look at verse 1. It says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, uh, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. See, when God called Joshua, he was already at work for the nation of Israel. 
He was already at work for the nation of Israel. And this brings us to our first point this morning. When God calls us, God calls us to join him in the work he is already doing. God calls us to join him in the work he is already doing. Pastor Adam mentioned this when he focused on Moses a few weeks ago. God was already at work to free Israel from slavery by the time he called Moses. This was God's plan, and he was working it out long before he called anyone to join him in the work. It was the same with Joshua. Moses had been leading Israel around the desert for 40 years. This was a long, long time coming, and it didn't begin with Joshua. See, when I took the job with YouthWorks, they, they had been in Cincinnati for nearly 10 years working with different ministry partners and, and churches, and God wasn't calling me to do something new there. He was calling me to join him in the work that he was already doing in that city. That's often how it works, right? Whatever God has called you to, you, you likely weren't the first person to occupy that space. God has a history of using people to accomplish his goals over a long period of time. And this is the same mentality that I like to get our students to take when we prepare to head out on a missions trip. God isn't absent from the community we are going to serve. We aren't bringing God to this place. He's been working there long before we were ever planning to go. But how can we posture ourselves to partner with God in the work he's already doing? That's true for mission trips, and it's true, true in, our, in our calling for every uh, day life. God is at work. Are we going to answer his call and work alongside him? And often, as in the case with Joshua, when, when God calls us to step into his plan, he doesn't leave us alone. That, that summer at YouthWorks, I had my dad encouraging me to step out in faith, and I had a team of people to work with all summer. We'll see that, that God makes the promise to Joshua that he will not leave him. But God also placed people in Joshua's life. Moses was a mentor to him. We see this back in Exodus chapter 24. Joshua spent time with Moses as he aided him in his leadership. And in, in the next chapter in Joshua, you see that there were a couple spies helping him. And, and Rahab made it possible for Israel to conquer Jericho. God didn't design us to do life alone and he won't leave us alone when he calls us into something new and frightening. When God calls us, God calls us to join him in the work he's already doing. Let's look back to the text. Verse 4. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. I want us to take a minute to appreciate the significance of what God has called Joshua to do here. Joshua is supposed to lead his entire nation into the promised land, something his ancestors were promised. And this brings us to our second point this morning. Don't let what God has called you to intimidate you. Don't let what God has called you to intimidate you. The task before Joshua was huge. Let's think about it. First, the promised land was a part of the covenant that the God had made with, with the people of Israel from long ago. This would have been talked about by the people of Israel for generations. The hope would have been held on to when they were in, this, in slavery in Egypt, parents and grandparents talking about a better life for their kids. Not only the prospect of, of taking the promised land, but that Joshua could make this a place where families prospered and life was better for Israel. It's incredible pressure. Not only this, God promised that Joshua would lead them uh, into the promised land, but this was accompanied by the task of defeating the current occupiers. He had to lead them to victory in battle also. Taking the promised land was a huge, huge task. Second, Joshua was taking over for Moses. And Moses was the man, right? He was the guy that freed the entire nation. Joshua wasn't just assuming the role of a leader in a vacuum. He was taking over for the leader. 
Have you ever been in that situation? Not like leading people to a promised land, but taking over for someone? Taking over for someone who is awesome? When you're stepping into a new, a new role at work or on a team and, and the person who is in that place before you was like a superstar at that, at that position? They maybe led the team to a whole new level or, or exceeded sales for the year or, or whatever it is, but they, they did a great job with it. Those are big shoes to fill. And that can easily bring up thoughts and feelings of inferiority and insecurity that you aren't going to be successful uh, or certainly not as successful as the last person and that you might fail altogether. Imagine that's exactly what Joshua was feeling. Moses didn't do everything perfectly, but he kept a nation going for 40 years in the desert. God met him on Mount Sinai. God used him to split the Red Sea. God did huge things through Moses. Would he really do big things for Joshua too? The pressure Joshua would have been feeling would have been incredible. And then third, uh, 40 years is a long time, right? Let's not forget this. I think sometimes when we just throw around time frames in the Bible without really stopping to consider the reality of that time frame, we lose the, the, the picture. 40 years. What were you doing 40 years ago? I, I wasn't doing anything. I, 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 can any of you guys remember 40 years ago? I, I mean, I don't even know what 40 years uh, feels like. That wasn't even a thought yet. But the people of Israel did know what 40 years felt like. Uh, 40 years is a long time to do anything, let alone wander in a desert. Like they knew 40 years. The people of Israel were anxious to put those 40 years behind them and take hold of what God had promised. And if I were Joshua, I would be thinking, well, if Moses couldn't get these people into the promised land after 40 years, what makes me think I'm going to do it? The pressure of an entire nation, 40 years of wandering, the promised future of Israel would have been weighing down on Joshua. I don't feel that level of pressure often, uh, but the pressure it, it, that we experience in real life, it, it's, it's real. The pressure to, to make things happen and succeed, it, it's real for us. See, Joshua had quite the task. You, we add all of that up and it becomes quite an intimidating call, doesn't it? How could any one person bear this load? It's too much, but, but God knew that this was intimidating for Joshua. So what did he tell him? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. God knew this was a lot, but he encouraged him over and over and over. I went through the last few chapters of, of Deuteronomy and the first couple of Joshua, and do you know how many times either Moses or God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous, those exact words, be strong and courageous? In just a few short chapters, Joshua is told by God or Moses, be strong and courageous six times. Six encouragements to keep going, no matter how big the task is. Don't let what God has called you to intimidate you. Let's go back to the text. Starting in verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This brings us to our third point. Courage isn't about being fearless. Courage isn't about being fearless. Courage is being afraid and trusting in God's strength and promise anyways. I'll say that again. Courage isn't about being fearless. Courage is being afraid, being fearful, but trusting in God's strength and in his promise anyways. See, courage has been built up so much in our popular culture to describe someone who faces anything without a hint of fear in their eyes. Someone who will rush into a, bil a burning building uh, without a second thought. And that 
is courageous. Of course it is. But that's, that doesn't define courage. See, when I decided to take the job that summer after freshman year, it, it wasn't because I had eliminated my anxieties in a day and a half. I knew that it was an experience that would help me grow and trusted that God was going to use me and work in my life through it, despite the fear I had, I had when facing this decision. And I'm not trying to hold myself up to you uh, as like some pillar of courage or shining example of boldness. It's not me. Uh, but this was a case where I was faced with a decision to make, and I chose to follow God's call through the fear and uncertainty. That summer ended up confirming my call into ministry with students, and I love what I get to do now almost 10 years later. See, real courage means recognizing the things that bring us fear and anxiety and making the choice to press forward through those fears. This is what God was calling Joshua into. God knows when something is going to be a challenge for us. He knew what he was asking of Joshua was a huge responsibility. Joshua had fear and anxiety about everything we just discussed, measuring up to Moses' leadership, meeting the expectations of the people of Israel, fulfilling the promise God made to Abraham so long ago. It it would have been overwhelming, and God wasn't asking Joshua to ignore any of that. Instead, he tells Joshua to push forward through the challenges, trusting that God's strength is enough. Recognizing that what is sitting before you, what God has called you to, uh, to go into is going to be really difficult, but, but not turning away from it. That's what courage is. Courage is being afraid, but trusting in God's strength and in God's promise anyways. But God's encouragement to Joshua to be courageous comes with a promise as well. God says, I will be with you wherever you go. I will be with you wherever you go. See, when God calls us into something, it doesn't come without the promise that he will be by our side through it. He will be leading us into it. We can face our challenges, our our obstacles, our fears, our anxieties, our calling, because God goes with us. He's asking us to trust in his strength, not in our strength. When Joshua led the people across the Jordan River and into the promised land, he was able to do so with courage because God was with him. He trusted that that when God promised his presence, he wouldn't disappoint. When Joshua led the Israelites to Jericho and they faced the impenetrable walls of the city and the army within, Joshua summoned courage and trusted that God was present and working. Uh, As Joshua went on to to defeat city after city, it was with this confidence that God was with him. So what if courage isn't about overcoming fears and anxieties, but rather about trusting God's purpose in the midst of them? What are you facing that causes worry, that causes you fear? Maybe you've taken on a new job or a new role at work and you don't feel up to the task. Maybe you just started uh, your freshman year at, at college. Maybe uh, you've been at, at, at school for a couple of years, but you feel God calling you into a new major uh, or a new field of studying. You don't know if you should just dive, uh, dive in head first or not. Uh, maybe the pressures and, and the stress of everyday life are causing your anxiety to spike and you don't know how you're going to continue managing life as it is. Look to the call of Joshua. The fear was enormous. The pressure was incredible. And God said, trust in my strength. And believe me when I tell you that I will be with you wherever you go. Take courage. Pursue God through the fear and doubt. Well, as Jesus often does, he modeled this for us better than anyone. Uh, if, you, if you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before uh, he would go on uh, to the cross uh, for the forgiveness of sin, you remember the scene? 
It was after the Last Supper. He had just washed his disciples' feet, and, and he retreated into the garden to pray. Uh, he told a few of his disciples that uh, my soul is deeply troubled, and he asked some of them to stay awake and keep watch, a very specific call which they completely failed to follow, but that's another sermon. Um, but while the disciples were sleeping, Jesus prays to his Father. Do you remember what his prayer was? My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Jesus was feeling the anxiety that you and I experience. He knew that the next day he would not only be killed on a cross, but he would also bear the weight of sin. Now that is a burden. We couldn't even begin to understand the pressure he was under. But what did Jesus say next? Yet not as I will, but as you will. Not as I will, but as you will. See, Jesus didn't stamp out his fear he was experiencing or the anxiety that, that he was experiencing, but in, instead he chose to trust in God's call for his life. He lived into it and he walked into it knowing that his father was with him. He faced the cross with courage, not the absence of fear, but the trust in God through the fear, through the anxiety. And what I love about the story of Joshua is that it is the perfect foreshadowing to, to the work that Jesus did for us. So just as God called Joshua to lead his people into the promised land, God called Jesus to pay the debt of sin that humanity owed to make a way for us to enter into the promise of eternity in the presence of God. God's call to both of them with a promise, uh, came with a promise of his strength and his presence. And both Joshua and Jesus weren't asked to eliminate their anxieties about it. But they were asked to courageously trust that God was big enough to follow through. I want to leave us with another promise from 1 John. God's continuing promise to everyone who trusts in him, no matter what he has called you to. It's from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 4. It's verse 4. It says this, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The, the Apostle John is writing, to, writing these words to a church that was facing uh, persecution by a surrounding population that was serving pagan gods and, and evil, evil spirits, and many in the church were up against neighbors who hated them. And he writes this to them, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. God's promise to us when we are facing the challenges and fears of life is that he is with us. And not only that, he is greater than anything we are up against. First thing today, God, when God calls us to join him, uh, he calls us to join him in the work that he's already doing. When we're called, we're called to join him in the work. Second, if God calls us into something, we don't need to be intimidated by that call. And third, God is asking us to take courage, not rid ourselves of fear, but to trust in his strength and in his promise anyways. Why? Because the spirit living in you is greater than the evil one, greater than the responsibilities at work, greater than the challenge of whatever trial is set before you today, greater than the painful situation you know you need to confront soon. Do you believe that? Are you living as if you believe that? North Haven, let, let's stop letting our fears and our anxieties limit us from fully participating in God's call in our lives. This past week, uh, our, our family went up north for a few days to get away. We had an awesome time with Grandma and Grandpa, uh, my, my in-laws, uh, and Aunt and Uncle, and their kid, uh, and the rest of our family. It was a great, great time, a few days up north. And our three-year-old, Brielle, had an absolute blast. We made s'mores. Um, 
Turns out she actually just likes eating the chocolate and marshmallows before they're cooked. Um, she, wasn't, she wasn't sold on a s'more thing yet, but she enjoyed it. Um, we, we made s'mores, we played on, on the beach, building sandcastles, uh, we went fishing, she caught uh, one pretty good size sunny and decided she was done with fishing. Um, uh, but she had a great time. But the thing that she loved the most was the pool. This place we went to had a nice uh, indoor pool, a little chilly up there, so outdoor swimming was probably not on the table. Uh, but anyways, this pool was indoors and it was wonderful and she absolutely loved it, but it didn't start out that way for her. The first day we went up, she just wanted to stay on the stairs uh, that kind of enter, that go down into the pool, right? She just wanted to stay on those stairs and play. And I tried to talk her into coming all the way in with me, but she, uh, she was afraid of the deep water. She's a smart girl. She, <laughs> she goes, it was too deep, Daddy. I'm too little. All right. Uh, so the first day, she stayed on the stairs. Then we went back the second day, and she started on the stairs again. I kept telling her, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fun. I'll be with you. I won't let you fall into the water. I'll hold on to you. And I knew that she would have the best time in the pool if she just would come out with me. And, and finally, I was able to convince her to come out. And she jumped into my arms, and we spent the next couple hours running around the pool, wherever she pointed me, as she was on my back and, and holding on to my neck, and she loved it. She absolutely loved it. She didn't want to leave the pool. But she was afraid to get in with me. She didn't know what to expect with the deeper water. But I was there. See, she, she didn't overcome her fear of the deep water to come out with me. She was still afraid. I probably have scratch marks like on my neck or something to prove it. She didn't overcome her fear of the deep water to come out with me. She was still afraid, but she trusted her dad. I told her that I would be with her, that I wouldn't let her fall in, that I wouldn't leave her alone, and she believed me. When I was preparing this sermon, I didn't expect my three-year-old to give me a lesson in courage, but that's exactly what she showed me in that pool this weekend. And that's what God is saying to us. Come into the deeper water. I won't leave you. I won't let you fall in. I will be with you the whole time. See, God isn't offended by our fear. God wasn't, I wasn't offended when, when Brielle was, was afraid to come out to the water with me. I just knew she would have so much fun. And that's what God is saying to us, that he has the best plan for us, that his call is what's best for us, and we just need to trust that he will be with us as we step into that call, that he will be with us, he goes before us, he won't let us fall, he won't let us sink. God is with you. He goes with you into whatever he has called you to. There is nothing that Jesus can't overcome, and he has his hands stretched out to you personally, inviting you to join him in his work. Will you trust his strength? Will you trust his presence in your life? Will you follow the call that God has set before you with courage? Not the absence of fear or worry, but trusting in God's strength and his promise for your life anyways. Will you step into that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for the example that you set for us with Joshua, how you used him to bring your people into the promised land, your call to him to be strong and courageous and to trust in your presence. Lord, I ask that you would help us to remember that as we go into this week. That whatever you've called us to, you're not going to leave us. It shouldn't intimidate us. That we, we need to trust in your strength and your promise for our lives, regardless of the fear and anxiety we have. Lord, as we prepare for communion, let, us, let this be a reminder of how much you love us, that you pursued us to the cross and you took our place there. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. It's in your name. Amen.